Joan Quinn Profile. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazine, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled are playwright Luis Alfaro and author Jean Noel Bassier. Journalist, musician, author, Jean Noel Bassier was born and raised in Southern California, went to UCLA on a scholarship, but left to be a musician. Was your scholarship for music, Jean? No. No. <laughs> it wasn't? <laughs> it wasn't, no. What, what were you studying? Well, at that time I was studying Russian. <laughs> oh, well, did that have anything to do with what you were going to do? <laughs> and my grandmother was Russian. I was fascinated by the language and uh -huh. into it. So when you left to, to follow your music, did your music career work out? Well, actually it, it didn't. We, I did a street sing on, on uh, the streets of Paris for a while. Oh, you did? <laughs> yeah. We used to do quite well, as a matter of fact. Really? Yeah, yeah. And uh, the Parisians loved it. Uh, when the police would come, we'd get in line. We used to sing outside theater, uh, movie theaters, and we'd kind of fade into the crowd. And the French just loved it. They, How many of you were there? Uh, well, we had two, three, four people at a time doing it. Is that right? Yeah. And you were living there? How long were you there? Um, I spent about two years in Europe. Uh, when you were doing this, were you writing about your experiences? Were you keeping a diary? Uh, you know, I was actually, but I didn't want to be a writer. I wanted to be a musician. I never thought I would be a writer. Were you writing music? Um, I did write some songs, yeah, I did. And, and were they from the experiences that you were having on the French streets? Uh, <coughs> that came later when I started writing songs. Th then I was just pretty much singing and, and playing guitar. At that time, when you were in Europe, were, did you kind of run away? I, I <laughs> ran away from home when I was 15. <laughs> was that kind of run away? <laughs> Well, I ran <laughs> but away. But how'd you get to UCLA then? I <laughs> uh, came back uh, at that time. You know, you were truant. Police brought me back. Oh, you did actually run away? I did actually run away to St. Louis from Los Angeles. How'd they find you? <laughs> <laughs> my best friend, who I ran away from, my big mistake was taking her to see Ben Hur. And after the movie, she was just very emotional, wanted to call home. So <laughs> you mean she ran away with you? She ran away with me, yeah. Oh, boy. Yeah, yeah. But that, I think. That childhood and those experiences led you on the, your other p career path besides being a musician. Yes, eventually, yeah. And, and what was that? Um, well, eventually became a writer and uh, um, had to tell the Space Patrol story because when I was a kid, um, having some not so good childhood experiences, at least there, wa there were these wonderful television programs like Space Patrol. What was so bad? Uh, I mean, you got to watch TV. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so how bad could that be? That was the one thing they let me do. <laughs> I see. <laughs> so I kind of slipped under the radar when I was watching TV. So why was this subject matter so important? Uh, I saw on TV in the early days some wonderful role models for kids. <laughs> and um, Space Patrol was a show that for some reason I really related to. And there was Commander Buzz Corey and Cadet Happy. And I think what I learned from the show was, was uh, somewhere in the universe there were these human beings that, that uh, were willing to sacrifice everything for each other, that really loved and respected each other. And it just was a wonderful kind of pattern, you know, to grow up with. Because it wasn't happening around me, but it was happening <coughs> somewhere in the galaxy. But weren't you looking at other TV shows at the time? Yeah, I, I watched TV and uh, living in Los Angeles, you know, there was... What else was going on? Um, gosh, there was Time for Beanie and there was, uh, oh. you know, other shows. Remember Engineer Bill and... <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and Seasick. Yeah, Mickey Mouse Club. The Cecil, yeah, Cecil right. The Seasick. The Seasick <laughs> Serpent. I haven't thought of that for a while. <clears throat> yeah. So, so the experience of a bad childhood or a sad upbringing led you to write this book, which yes. is so thick <laughs> and so heavy, 
and such small typeface. <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, you must have been writing for years. <laughs> How long did it take um, you to write this? Well, it actually took, I became a journalist, so I mean, I, I, by that time it got the writing thing down, but it actually took three years to write the book when I sat down and focused on writing the book, but it took 20 years to gather the interviews for the book. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. As a child, uh, and I, I guess you lived on the west side and you yeah. came across a lot of celebrities. You met right. a lot of celebrities. How did you meet those people? I went and to who school. Were they? Well, I went to school with the kids of celebrities, like, um, like Frank Sinatra Jr., uh, Errol Flynn's daughter Deirdre, and I didn't know who half these people were. I knew who Sinatra was, but there was a uh, Anne Wid Widmark was in my class, and I didn't know who her father was. You know, Richard Widmark, and no idea. At um, Pally High? Um, I did go to Pally High, and they, a lot of them were at Emerson Junior High. Oh, they were. Oh, yeah. way back. Yeah, way back. Yeah. Well, did you think about being? Um a celebrity when you were mingling with these kids or did you think about meeting their parents? You know, I was pretty much unconscious of it. They were just, I mean, I knew that their parents were famous, but for some reason it didn't matter a lot then, you know. Um, I, I didn't have uh, that kind of awareness of it. At the time when you said you start, you went into journalism first because it took you 20 years to collect all the work that went into Space Patrol, the book. Um, you were in Northern California <laughs> on a cattle ranch. Yes. How could that happen? <laughs> How could someone your size be a, in charge of a cattle ranch? You know, the rancher trusted me, and I was always um, grateful for that because it was like having a second childhood on a cattle ranch. And growing up and uh, just having a, 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 this kind of experience of being on a ranch and, and uh, dealing with what you, you know, as if you had a childhood on a ranch, it was really wonderful. So. But you had a different responsibility than being a kid on a ranch. Well, yeah, I had to set the irrigation pipes and feed the cattle. And, um, but mainly setting the irrigation pipes, uh, which you do two times a day and sometimes three, is moving these long 50-foot pipes uh, across it's the like pasture. like watering the lawn? Uh, yeah, it's like, it's like <laughs> a huge <laughs> nightmare watering of the lawn. Is that right? <laughs> and yeah. then is that when you started writing for newspapers? Yes. Yes, it, it was. And were you writing about these experiences? No, not, not really. I was a musician. I, I, I actually was, my ex-husband and I were singing in clubs and uh, making a living at music oh, you for, were. for 10 up years. Up there too? Yeah, yeah, up there. Oh, I see. And then we did a circuit in California. We did Lions Restaurants. And Under what names? Um, Hank and Jean. Oh, <laughs> so just like the old TV day. Yeah, <laughs> right. So here you're, you're consumed with Space Patrol. When did it come into your mind that you should actually write a book, and how would it come into your mind? It was totally unexpected. I actually had forgotten about Space Patrol, but um, I write about this a bit at the beginning of the book where one day I was um, standing outside a nostalgia store, like a memorabilia store in Guerneville, California, because that's where we were living. And Guerneville is a small town on the Russian River. And all of a sudden, it was like a voice said to me, go inside the store and ask about Space Patrol. And that was really the first time that I'd thought about the show in like 20 years. And so I went inside. <laughs> Go inside and write about it. Yeah, and just, just ask about it. So I went inside, and it turned out that the guy had just opened the store I, like a week or two ago. And Space Patrol was one of his favorite shows. And so he said, oh, I love that show. And it was 1984. And there were long lines, you know, to rent video recorders outside the uh, warehouse because nobody actually had a video uh -huh. recorder that I knew. And he had one, this guy David, who had the store. He said, if you'll come back tomorrow, I, I actually have a Space Patrol show on tape and, I'll, and I have a video recorder oh. and I'll bring it into the store. And this was like, I don't know, going to the moon or something. It was like a really strange experience. But you had yeah. all these people, you had uh, all these people to write about. Yeah, actually, it's the cast. Yeah, and I'm a, this is part of the cast. Yeah, that's Ed Kemmer and Lynn Osborne, who starred in the show as Commander Buzz Corey and Cadet Happy. But did you ever get to interview any of these people? Because you had to start uh, finding people to interview. I did find almost everybody. Lynn Osborne, however, on uh, the uh, I guess that would be screen left, uh, died uh, about two or three years after the show left the air in 1958. So I did find his sister, however, and interviewed her extensively. 
and then you had to get a hold of all these other people. Right, and the crew, and the production crew at ABC. Did you give me the big picture of, you didn't give me the big picture of oh. the whole crew. Um, but yeah. it's, on the, it's on the cover, it's on your little TV right. set. Right, and it's actually in And the how book. many people uh, were on the crew? Well, I mean, not on the crew. In the, in the cast? Yeah, in the There cast. were five principal cast members. So you decided you were going to write about each one of those people. Well, actually, in the book, I kind of tied the whole thing together. It was kind of unexpected the way it all came together. But I started, um, I, I interviewed all the cast, and then I started interviewing the production crew. And a lot of these people had worked at ABC and did all the shows like you asked for it. They'd be like on the set all day doing one show after another. But they all remembered Space Patrol really as their favorite show. So you, you ha got these characters and you wrote histories, actually histories, historic backgrounds on everyone, like biographies. Uh, yeah, it's, it's sort Pretty of like... concise, the way <laughs> it all goes together. It kind of came together. It's, it's uh, more about... Uh, the book is really about early television, about as seen through the eyes of Space Patrol. And, and talking about early television, there was so much marketing going on. Yes. But marketing not like today, in these kind of cheesy little ways. <laughs> what is this? <laughs> that is the Martian totem head mask. <laughs> and how do they send for that? Um, well, they used to send a box top uh, from Ralston cereals and 25 cents in coins. And, and then you would wait for the mail to come and, and a lot of kids across the country would order these box top premiums and these, these things are worth a lot now. For example, the little decoder ring, is, which was 25 cents in coin, is now worth about $1,500. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. and, and then you could send for this kind of thing? And the coloring book. You know, book. We, talk, we talk about the way marketing is now. You could never get anything for a coin or a dollar right, or anything right, like that. Right. Um, and then in the book, you, at the back, you have all these these things. Yeah, um, that was the, the actual envelope that one of the premiums came the in. The marketing <laughs> that, yeah. that you have at the back of the book. Yeah. But you also um, have the titles of, of the shows. Episode. There's an episode guide, right? And then you have how they sent for these things. Right. But the book this is, is a puzzle, <laughs> so I have to hold it kind of. Yeah. But, you know, these are the things that, that uh, our parents threw out that are now worth, you know, that you could buy a new car with, you know, if you <laughs> if held on to them. <laughs> Let me hold it up like this. But, the book but this is was a puzzle. Right? Yes, that was and a puzzle. And look at the spaceship. Yeah. 19, what was it, 80? Uh, the show ran from 50 to 55. Uh. And, and the book is about Space Patrol and how they did it, and it's about early television and live TV and the, the, how they just invented TV as they went. It was all a spur of the moment thing. It was like, how do we get a picture out of a camera and into someone's living room? And they had to figure that out before they could do other things. Some, there were many tragedies that took place among the, the um, cast, mm -hmm. and you write about those things. One of them was who, uh, Ken Mayer, uh, well, actually, Lynn Osborne. Uh, Lynn Osborne, yeah. yeah. And then uh, you had some good stories about Ken as well. Yeah, no, and Ken Mayer actually had a successful career as an actor. A lot of people remember him on Bonanza, uh, where he went after Space Patrol. Oh, I see. Um, but Lynn Osborne was sort of the tragedy of the show because he died about from a brain tumor about three years after the show went off the air. Do we have a sequel to this book? Um. <laughs> we, have, uh, we have another uh, TV show for I that period? Think I've, uh, well, I think Space Patrol was it for me. <laughs> My next book may be about something totally different. Thank you so much for coming on Thank today. Thank you, Joan. Thank we'll be right back with playwright Luis Alfaro. Hi, welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. I'm Joan Quinn, and I'm here with Native Angelino, just like myself, uh, Luis Alfaro. Luis Alfaro likes to say he never went to college, but then he adds that he has this list of accomplishments that I read in his bio. Poetry, short stories, performances, journalism, director, curator, producer, and community organizer, how do you do all of that? Um, his work has been enjoyed from California to the far reaches of Europe. And one year that was so exciting for us is he became a MacArthur Fellow. We have never had a... M <laughs> we have never had 
a MacArthur Fellow. I think, did you hear that noise go off when yeah. I said MacArthur <laughs> Fellow? I mean, it's like the Genius Award. <laughs> I think it follows me. I know. How, how did your colleagues feel about this? Well, I think it was a kind of extraordinary moment for us as a city. You know, and I always think that uh, that award doesn't belong to me. It actually belongs to all my colleagues. So when I got the award, I said Aww. this was uh, an award that, that actually uh, recognized the work that people in Los Angeles were doing. Because, you know, many of us who work on the West Coast, you know... Uh, we're left aside, aren't we? We kind of are a lot of times. So I think it recognized, you know, progressive art. It recognized people that were doing really interesting art in the, in the uh, city, but also in the region. So I was very excited. I think it was a, a great way of recognizing uh, the work that everybody's doing. I guess everybody. You encountered it all, and you brought it to us because it's just um, that kind of thing where somebody recognizes you. you ha sure. You're the voice of the community sure, in a sure. way. Your new play, Hero, right. um, is so California to me. It's right. in El Monte. Tell me how you started writing that. I'm going to hold this up. Well, I always write plays about Los Angeles. That's where my plays are. They always take place in LA. But I wanted to write something about the war, and I was thinking a lot about, like many people in the region, I think we're thinking about what this war means and where it's coming from and when is it going to end. And I, I started writing about the war, and I realized that I didn't really know how to talk about the war. So it's really a play about how we as Americans are just having trouble figuring out how to talk about Iraq because there's so much we don't know. But right? it was more of an anthropology. It was more of a look into a family right. to me. Right. And it was like this contemporary language. Right. I think uh, <laughs> maybe because I teach, you know, I also teach and I teach at USC. So I'm always around young people. So uh -huh. a lot of what I was trying to do is capture the essence of what uh, young people are doing. But it, yeah, you know, with that pop culture. Pop culture, sure. The references to <laughs> to the region. And I always write plays that are referencing the, the area. Well, that's what was so funny to me. You're talking about 21 Forever and right. Target. And, and the Galleria. <laughs> no, the Absolutely. I mean, all this, and, the, and the people on stage are speaking that way and talking right. about those things. And it's in a tiny little theater. Tell right. us a little bit about that theater. Well, it's a little theater called Studio Stage. It's on uh, Western, uh -huh. right near Beverly. And I love it because, you know, uh, sometimes I write really small plays. Like, uh -huh. next year I'm writing a play for the Getty Villa that's a gigantic play, you know. But right now I wanted to write something small and tight and compact. And I think that the theater, it kind of the environment should match the play. So I was really happy that we found a theater that kind of matches that, right? Oh, that was great. Because sometimes yeah. you, can, you can write a play and it's too big a space, you know, and... Uh, oh, you don't think about that, really. Because you yeah. think that they bring the stage in and make it smaller. But it always but feels... I, just, I did a play last a year at the Goodman Theater in Chicago, and it was a big, gigantic theater, and, you know, uh, I write small. So uh, <laughs> what happens is that, you know, the audience is kind of looking in like this. And you really kind of want to create a space where the audience doesn't have to do this so much as do this. Well, you know? we're, we're right on yeah, the stage. Yeah, the focus. And uh, it's funny because it is very family. And right. you can see the food, totally. macaroni and frank. And we heat up that food and they eat it every night. They make <laughs> macaroni and cheese and pizza and pickles. And <laughs> so, you know, it's and interesting. And they smoke and it, and it smells smoke. like they're smoking grass. Well, you know, I wrote it, it kind of, what, the reason why I started writing the play was <laughs> I was listening to an old Cheech and Chong, do you know Cheech yeah, and Chong? Yeah, I was course. listening to an old Cheech and Chong skit, and uh, every scene had a scene of smoking pot, and so I thought it would be interesting to see what, what would happen if every scene had that, and, you know, uh, they're not really smoking pot, because that's against the law, but uh, they're smoking oregano. And oh, oregano. it smells different. Yeah, but it smells a lot like marijuana. Yeah, you can so. smell. I, I mean, I could smell it in the right. theater, and I knew it wasn't cigarettes. Right. Sometimes it smelled like cigarettes. Right. Sometimes it smelled like something else. But the way they were doing it, too, was well, like I a like part of their... Absolutely. I like environment. So I think that if you're going to do that for an audience, the audience should smell a play. They you know? did. We did. Yeah. And if you're going to have food... You shouldn't fake it. You should eat the food, right? I so, don't know. Do they always do that? No, not always, <laughs> but I think that we should because we're trying to blur that line, but I also think it's fun when it's real. When, you know? I, when I went to see the play, you were sitting there. John uh, Rivera was there yeah. who directed it. Right. And I looked at the two of you, and you were actually laughing at the way <laughs> the the 
actors right. were delivering their lines. Do right. you feel comfortable, or do you feel like you're hearing them for the first time? Well, it's a new play, <laughs> so because I'm, I'm, you know, I've been writing right up to the last minute. Oh, uh, so uh, I think uh. for me, when I'm in there, I I want to experience it the way an audience experiences, <laughs> and I also feel. I have nothing to lose. You know, I'm not one of those playwrights who goes in a corner and throws up. I actually am in the moment, and I'm with them, and we're going through this experience together. And uh, I feel like you enjoy it. You know, you have a good time with it. But was that enjoying, or was that just like, I, I thought you were seeing it for the first time, oh, when you kinda, were laughing at everything. I kind of was. Well, you know, I, I sometimes actors do things <laughs> That's that you wondered. don't mean to do, right? Yeah, that's what I wondered. And I love when actors take your work away from you. I say, I love oh, it. Because I think you birth the play and then people uh -huh. take it. So, you know, I've had the pleasure of seeing a lot of different productions of plays done. Uh -huh. And every time somebody <laughs> does a production of a play, it's different, you know? So I don't, um, I don't have any problem when an actor interprets. This is very different. You know, we have two casts. That's what I was going to talk about next. Tell us about it. You have a, a, a Latino, Latino cast. Latino cast. And then we have an Asian cast. Why did you do that? Well, I really wanted to talk about race. I really wanted to talk about how middle class people in LA are looking at the war. And one of the, the discussions that happens a lot in the city is when we talk about race in LA, we talk about black and white. Right. But actually, oh. the two largest growing segments of the population in LA right now are the Latino population and the Asian population. So I thought it would be interesting to talk about oh. working class oh. Asians and Latinos. So we, when John first suggested it, he wanted to do a Latino cast. And I said, well, let's see if we can make another company at the same time so that when you go see the play, it's really different. The way the Asian company performs it is completely different than the way the Latino co Oh, completely different. And you have the lead sitting behind us watching the Latino yeah. um, a company, the right. cast, and she said, one of the most excruciating times of my life was yesterday, and I went, why? You were in the lead, and she says, because Luis was sitting here, <laughs> and yet you were just so yeah. a part of it all. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's a collaboration. And, you know, we're all in there <laughs> together. If I fail, we're all going to fail. If they fail, yeah. I fail. You know, so I'm more, uh, I came from community-based programs. So my, my thing is that I was in a lot of collectives. And the collective oh, right. excellence rises together, right? So it's not about one person. It's not about the writer. It's about everybody, you know? And so I like to think that this is a shared Art is a shared experience, you know? So I don't feel, uh, I know the actors sometimes feel a little scared when I'm there, but uh, they shouldn't because I'm, I'm as excited and as positive and I want them to win. I want them to succeed. That's what's so great. You know? And so does their director, right? Absolutely. He's wonderful. And, you know, I think he is there to make sure they succeed. You know, we want to create the best possible play we can. You've gotten so many fellowships. <laughs> Haven't you? I yes, have, you I have. have, you have. And when I first met you, you were doing sitting on panels for the California Arts Council. That was That's many right. years ago. And they we always called you because we wanted your voice and we would hear what you were saying. But w one of the other things that I think was great is that you were in the Latino, um, what was it, at the Mark Taper? Oh, the Latino Theater Initiative. Well, I started in the Theater Initiative and then I moved up to producer at the Mark Taper Forum, and then by the end, right before I left, I was in charge of the new play program. You were there 10 years? 10 years. That's Can so you believe great, it? but you kept that program going. Well, you know, you I'm really or proud. Got it going. I'm really proud because we were able to, uh, I think in the end, we gave like 350 major American artists money to live. We did, I think, 140 <laughs> different readings of plays. And so we birthed a lot of plays that we didn't necessarily produce, but theaters around the country produced. Where was it? Where did that all happen? Did you actually use the theater facilities? Yeah, you know, the nice thing at the Mark Tate Performance that a lot of people don't know is there's these rehearsal rooms. Oh. So there's a lot of space, you know, and so I was always doing stuff there off site. We had a taper two space. I don't know if you ever went to that space in Culver did. City called the Ivy Substation. I did. Is that yours? That was oh, ours. That was yours. And then the Actors King yes. took over. Yes, and, that uh, was and then the Kirk Douglas Theater is a second Fabulous. space. So, you know, there was a lot of that going on. But it was time to go. It was time to go. I think artists have uh, lives, many lives. And one of the things I've realized that for me, it's always every seven years. Oh. So I stayed three years too you long. You stayed three <laughs> years. But the, the big turning point was electricidad. That's right. That's right. And was that done in Spanish? No, that was done in English. It was an, I wrote an adaptation of Electra and oh, the Sophocles right. Electra. But what I did is I did it in Spanglish 
which is very much a language that exists in East LA. Uh -huh. So mostly in English, but using Spanish words. And so I think it's another kind of way of hearing uh, language. You but know? that was on the taper stage. That was on the taper main stage. I did a number of pieces on the taper and, main stage. And um, who was in it? And what did the sound like? Oh, well, it was really fun because I, actually I wrote it in Tucson, Arizona. And, I, uh, <laughs> and it was done in Tucson. Then it was done at the Goodman in Chicago. So by the time it came to L.A., even though it was a play about L.A., it was. It had already sort of had a bunch of different lives. Oh, it so had already it, been to Tucson. It had already been Tucson. It right. already been, and now it's been done. I think 15 different productions, and it just got done in Greece, which I'm really excited I about. I know that's So what a Greek I mean. classic, it done in Greece. To the furthest yeah. <laughs> corners of the world. As but Alfaro. I love that my that my Chicano, <laughs> that being Chicano, Mexican American, <laughs> we've gone to Greece. You know, yeah. so we're, that's the best cultural exchange. So you know? so um, what was the language like? The language is very much a poetry that was English and Spanish. We call it Spanglish, so because we just talk that way. So naturally, when if I was you add Spanish words, yeah, to I, I add a lot of Spanish words. And um, like normally, if I'm talking with my family, we do a mix. Like most, I think cultural people do, is we do this wild yes, mix. Right. But we mix English and Spanish in the same sentence. Yes. Well, so I, I think would a lot say of like, do. "Hola, Joan, how are you?" Right. So I would yeah, mix exactly, that, right? right? Or you know, like, "Hey, hey what's up today?" You know, and I, but I'd be mixing it with a lot of a lot of Spanish. That kind of that so, kind of. So yeah, it's just the language we speak. So I wanted people in LA to hear how people in LA speak, right? Because I think it's really important to hear how the city operates. And we have such an amazing city, so how the city, um, different segments of the city work, is really, really important for us as citizens to get to know our, our community. Well, I think the idea that you've done all that, you were in Hartford, Connecticut, really Hartford quickly, for a year. too, for a year, a we year. missed you. Thank yeah. you, a and year you, you is you a long time. And you put on a, a play there that was I yours. did a long-term project for a year where I interviewed 150 people. And, uh, and there were people from all walks of life, and I'm going to write a play for next year. But in the meantime, they did a play of mine there, and that was really fun. Well, I'm glad we had a MacArthur winner on the show. <laughs> thanks, Louise. You'll have many. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. It's good to be here. And thanks for watching the Joan Quinn Profiles today. Keep writing to 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, Los Angeles, 90017. See you next time.